Welcome back to the Functions Unit. Today we're going to be taking a look at relations and functions vocabulary. So a little less math and a little more memorizing terms. We're going to start by taking a look back at things we need to remember in order to move forward. So the first thing we need to remember is so far we've looked at relationships that have been linear. This, this means they've all formed straight lines. Not all relationships, however, are linear, so not all of them make lines. Some are nonlinear, meaning they make other shapes other than lines. So let's go ahead and take a look at what relations mean right now. All right, taking a look at relations here, a relation is any group of ordered pairs. Relations are not always linear, and they can be displayed in three ways. You can show them either using tables, graphs, or ordered pairs. A good way to think of a relation is a relationship between x and y, or a set of ordered pairs. Now let's take a look at a special type of relation known as a function. Now talking about functions, they are a very important term to understand. They're one of the cornerstones of things that you need to know, not only this year, but moving forward through mathematics. So a function is a relationship between two sets of data with one property that every input has only one output. So that's what makes a function different than every other relation. It has only one output for every input. Now, what is an input? An input is any x value. So when we're talking about inputs, we're talking about x values. That means when we're talking about outputs, we're talking about y values. When we're talking about the domain, that's the set of all x values. And we're talking about the range, that's the set of all y values. So input goes with x value, domain goes with x value, y value goes with output, range goes with y value. When we're talking about the independent variable, those are words used to describe the input or x values. So when we're using words and not numbers, we're talking about the independent variable. Likewise, when we're talking about the dependent variable, again, we're going to be using words to describe the input or the y values. So again, when we're using words, we're talking about the dependent variable. Now let's take a look at example A. So here we are at example A. It says look at the relation below and graph the data on this table. So it looks like somebody's been shopping at Target and they've spent some money on some items. So we're gonna go ahead and put those points on our graph here. So we've got the number of items purchased and the money in dollars spent. So notice down there in our graph, we've got the number of items along our x-axis, and we've got the total amount of money spent on our y-axis. So let's go ahead and plot our points. So the first point is we've bought eight, eight items for $5. So we're going to go over to our eight, and we, the graph goes by 10, so we know that five is going to be about halfway, so we're going to put our point there. The next person spent 14, or they bought 14 items, so they spent $40, so we'll go over to our 14, and we'll put our $40 there. Next we have they went spent two items, or bought two items, and spent $60. And the last person bought six items for $35. So now that we've got our points on the graph, we have some questions to answer. So should we connect these dots? Should we connect them and make them some sort of graph? The answer there is going to be no. No, we're not going to connect these points. The reason why is the points between the plotted points really have no meaning. That's the difference between a graph that is discrete, meaning that we're not going to connect the points, and continuous, meaning that it's connected via a line or some other shape. So this is a discrete graph because the points are not connected. The points in the middle don't really mean anything. You can't say the points between two and four, or the numbers that we plotted, two and six, mean anything. Because when you go to Target, depending on what you buy and how many of those things you buy, it changes the price. You can buy one really expensive item, or you can buy 17 really cheap items, and that will change the price. So the points in the middle don't really affect one another. They don't matter. So therefore, we're not going to connect our points. The last thing that we need to do is write this relation as a set of ordered pairs. So we're going to do that by using this special shape on the end known as a brace. Anytime that you write a set of ordered pairs in this unit, you are going to need to have these braces. They don't have to be drawn perfectly, but they should be able to be identified as braces. Anytime that you're writing a set of ordered pair in a relation or a function, they need to be shown with those braces on the side denoting that they are part of a set. Now let's move on to example B. Here we are at example B, where we've got a graph that shows inches of snow and the number of days out of school once you have those inches of snow. 
Now we have some questions here that are talking about our independent and dependent variables as, long as, our, as well as our domain and range for this relation. So remember, when we're talking about independent and dependent variable, we want words. So independent variable is going to be our x value or the thing that we're going to be changing or the thing that's going to affect the dependent variable. So which thing is going to be affected is going to be determining our dependent variable. So is the inches of snow going to be affecting the number of days that we get out of school? Most likely. As opposed to the other way where the number of days we get out of school somehow create more inches of snow? That seems unlikely. So our independent variable in this case is going to be the inches of snow because that's the thing that's going to affect the number of days that we get out of school or our dependent variable. Our dependent variable depends on what happens with our independent variable. Now the second part of our problem asks for the domain and range of this relation. So again I'm going to be writing down all of the values because when we're talking about the domain we're talking about all the x values. We're talking about the range we're talking about all the y values. So I'm going to be writing down all the x values that come with the independent variable and that's going to be right here 3, 8, 11, 15, and 21. Now it's important to note a few things here. Because I was writing points I made sure that I had my braces here because I'm writing points in the function unit to donate they are part of a set. I also put the points in order from least to greatest and anytime that you're listing the domain and range you should be listing them in order from least to greatest or the one that have the less value to the one that has the greatest value. Now I'm going to do the same thing with my range or all of the y values and again I'm going to use my braces and again I'm going to put them in order from least to greatest. Now let's take a look at example C. A couple points that so here we are in example C and this time they've given us a graph and they're asking us again about independent and dependent variable as well as domain and range. Last time we were given a table, this time we were given a graph. So we're going to need to start with our independent variable and as we know that's going to be our x value. So taking a look at the x label on our graph, we know that's going to be our independent variable. So our independent variable here is going to be the age of dog. The dependent variable, we can look along our y-axis and we can see the weight of the dog. So that's going to be our y-value or weight of dog or our dependent variable. Now we need to list all of our domain and range for this relation, which becomes a little more complicated because their points are not given to us. So what we need to do is take a look on our graph, first going horizontally to find all of our domains. Then we're going to go vertically to find all of our ranges. So when we go here we've got one point at one half, we've got another point at three, and we've got another point at two, another point at one, another point at six, another point at eight. So that's going to be our domain as we go across. Now I sometimes have more than one point at a place. So for example I have two points at six. I'm only going to write it down one time because I'm only talking about the numbers of the domain and six is part of the domain. I don't need to show that it happened more than one time. It could happen a hundred times. I just need to record that six is part of the domain. So again, I'm going to start with my braces. Again, they don't have to be the prettiest thing that you've ever seen, but they should be identified as braces. It looks like we have one half or 0.5 as one of our points. We have a point at one. We have another point at 2, we have a point at 3, then we have our one point at 6, and finally a point at 8, and then we're again we're going to close with our braces. Again, they don't have to be the prettiest thing in the world, but they should be identified as braces. The next thing we're going to do is write down our range. So we're going to do that by going horizontally. These are by 10, so I've got some points that look like they're at 5, another point at 10, another point at 20, a couple points at 30, a point at 50 and a point at 80. So again I'm going to write those down using my braces. Again they don't have to be the prettiest thing in the world and I'm going to put them in order from least to greatest. So again I've got a point at 5, I've got a point at 10, I've got a point at 20, I've got a couple points at 30 but again we're only going to write it down one time. We've got a point at 50 and a point at 80 and again we're going to close our braces. Again the braces don't have to be super pretty just make them look like braces or the best that you can do. Alright now let's move on to example D. 
So here at example D, we've got a multiple choice question. It says answer the questions based off the table, and it says which table has the domain of negative 2, 0, 4, and 5, and which table has the range of 3 and 4. So we're going to start with our domain. We're looking for negative 2, 0, and 4, and since we're talking about domain, we're looking for x values. So going to our first column, I've got negative 1. No, that's not something we're looking for. 2, not something we're looking for. Three, not something we're looking for. So number one does not appear to be helping us out in the domain category. Now let's take a look at number two. Negative two, yep, I was looking for that. Zero, I was looking for that. Four, yes, I was looking for that. And five, I was looking for that. So at least number two is going to be an example of that. Let's see if there's any others. Negative one, no. Two, no. Three, no. And five, yes. Well, it's got one of the things that we're looking for, but the other three, not so much. So three is not an option. And the last one, we've got negative one, no. Negative one, no. Two, no. And three, no. So the only choice for that one is number two. Now let's do the same thing with our range. We're looking for a range of three and four. So y's got three. It's got four. Oh, but then it has five. So although it has three and four, it has two points that we don't have listed. So number one cannot be our choice. Looking at number two, we don't have three or, well, we have three, but we don't have four. So number two is not going to be correct. Now, again, number three has three and four, but it also has two points that we're not looking for. So therefore, it is not number three. Number four, we've got three, three, four, four. So yes. Number four does work for what we're looking for. Now let's take a look at the last example. So this time it's kind of a select all, and they've given us select all the numbers of, that match this description, all the members of the set of the domain. So again, since we're talking about domain, we're going to be looking for x values. So our first one has 3, 5, and 6. So looking at my number line, does that fit in our domain? So I've got 3, I've got a point at 3. 5, I've got a point at 5, and 6, I've got a point at 6. So all of those points fall within the line, so that is a correct answer. Looking at my next one, I've got 1, 5, and 10. So 1, not on the line, and any other one doesn't really matter because we know one of them is not on the line. Same thing for the next one, I've got a point at 0, but that's not on the line, so that's not going to be a right answer. 2.5 does have a point on the line. 4 does have a point on the line, and 7 does have a point on the line, so that's going to be a correct answer. 8, 9, and 10, 8 is on the line, but 9 and 10 are not, so that is not a correct answer. Again, we were only looking for a domain or x values that fell along that line. If they didn't have all of the values in their set fall on that line, they were not a correct choice. That brings us to the end of this video, so if you like this video, go ahead and throw us a thumbs up. If you love this video, go ahead and throw us a sub, and we will catch you in the next one.